this year in Jesus name. Nay, in all these things we are more. It says it's not of the past. It's not that we were. There are some people that say, that will say the good old days. The good happy days of the past. It's like all the good good things that happened in the past and now we are to rub our nose on the mud, in the mud, on the ground. No. At the present time, our victory is now. I said this present year, our victory is now. That's why it says we are more than conquerors through him that loves us. And as long as he keeps on loving us, we are more than conquerors. And his love will never stop. His love will never fail. And that love is upon your life. You believe that, you'll be a conqueror. As you look at uh, the epistle to the Romans, you, you need to understand the way God led Paul the Apostle to write. And the way God ministered unto him so that he will minister unto us. It's divided into two parts, actually. Most of the epistles are. And in this epistle to the Romans, he has one part and then he has the second part. The first part, he deals with doctrine. And in the second part, it deals with duty. Anytime you pick the epistles, you need to look for that. That first of all, there will be a foundation at the first part of the epistle. And there you will find the fruit of the Spirit of God coming upon your life. Foundation on the one side and then the fruitfulness on the other side. In, in, as you look at the epistles, it first of all lays the foundation of faith. And then it gives you the fruit of faithfulness. That's how the epistles were, are always structured. First of all, it's about our redemption. And then you'll go to chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, on. And then it says, now that you understand redemption, let me talk about responsibility, righteousness. First of all, it lays the foundation with the creed. That is, this is what to believe, the creed. And then it will come to the second part, that will be the conduct. First of all, it is the 
believe. Believe this. This is the word. He establishes the belief, and then after that, he will tell you the behavior that will match that belief. He already said in the foundation, we can say this way. He first of all lays the principles, and then after that, the practice. And as you look at uh, the epistle to the Romans, it tells us, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ that loves us. That's in the part of the foundation, in the part of the redemption, in the part of the creed, in the part of the doctrine. Now the second part actually starts from Romans chapter 12. Look at Romans chapter 12. It says, I beseech you, therefore. You know that word, therefore? Because of all the doctrine I laid, chapters 1 to 11. Because of the foundation you have, chapters 1 to 11. Because of the redemption, so plain and so clear, chapters 1 to 11. Because of that thing that I've told you, which is the principle from chapters 1 to 11. Therefore, now from verse 12, let's go to the practice. Let's go to the practical. Let's go to the responsibility and the duty. How do you make it happen? That you are more than conquerors through Christ who has loved us. What's your part to play in that? I've told you what Christ has done. I've told you about redemption. I've told you about the foundation. I've pointed you to Calvary, to the cross, and to Christ who died for you to make you a conqueror. What do you do? That's why you have the word, therefore. That brings us to Romans chapter 12. And in Romans chapter 12, I'm talking to you on the believer's road map for constant victory. The believer's road map for constant victory. If we are more than conquerors, through him that loved us, what is the blueprint? What is the plan? How do you get that victory? And make that victory constant, permanent in your life. Because this year, victory has come. We are more than conquerors. That's the foundation, that's the principle, that's the redemption, that's the creed, that's the belief. Now, the other side, therefore. And as you look at chapter 12 of Romans, you'll see three words that are very, very important. Number one, look at this word, sacrifice. Look at chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. The word sacrifice. I mean, there's another word you're going to find, the verb form. form. Look at verse 11. It's the word service. It says in verse 11, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Serving the Lord. So you have one part. How am I going to have the road map to victory? Constant victory. Consistent victory. And continual victory. A kind of climax of victory. More than ever, I add, more than I ever had since I became a Christian. How is this year going to be the greatest year you have ever lived? Because that's going to happen. I said that's going to happen. Number one, sacrifice. Number two is service. Number three, look at verse 16. It says, be, it says, be of the same mind one to another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. One word that I can use to summarize all that is selflessness selflessness you're thinking of others you're reaching out to others you're touching others you're lifting others you're encouraging others the happiness you want you are planting in the lives of others now the lord has told us he says give 
and it shall be, tell me, given unto you, pressed down, running over, will all the people put in your bosom the epistles put to it as whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also tell me, reap. How many people don't understand? They say, I am looking for love, I'm looking for fellowship, I'm looking for encouragement, and they say, I'm sowing the seed. What seed is that? They give money. You, you understand? Every seed you sow will come back in the same kind. If you give money, money will be given back to you. If you give love, love will be given back to you. If you give encouragement, encouragement will be given back to you. You know, what you sow is what you reap. And so, if you're looking for fellowship, sow fellowship. If you're looking for encouragement, sow, sow fellowship and encouragement. If you're looking for other people, other people are neglecting me and they are not helping me. I, I, I was, uh, you know, down. They didn't come to lift me up. Go and sow that in the lives of other people. Lift them up. You'll find a hundred other people coming to lift you up. They lift you up so high, you'll say that's enough. Because you'll have more than enough. I said this year, you'll have more than enough. Number one, sacrifice. Number two, service. Number three, selflessness. And look at this, number one now. As we look at the message, the believer's blueprint of the believer's roadmap for constant victory. Number one, the compatible sacrifice of separated believers. Our sacrifice to be compatible, comparable to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Therefore, because of the mercies of God, because of his sacrifice, because of the price he paid for you, and because he didn't reserve anything, he gave up everything. Your sacrifice must be comparable, compatible to the sacrifice that brought you into the kingdom. Number one, therefore, the compatible sacrifice of separated believers. Number two, now we're to serve. And as we look at that chapter, it's talking about our service. Number two, the consecrated service of sanctified believers. It tells us about the believers here. These are not the wishy-washy churchgoers. These are the, not the so-so denominational people. These are people who break their hearts to the cross, their hearts to Calvary. And the blood of Jesus Christ washes them and cleanses them and converts them and purifies them and sanctifies them. And now they are able to serve and their service is fruitful. Your service this year will be fruitful. I said your service will be fruitful. The, com the, the consecrated service of sanctified believers. And now he tells us in, this, in the third part. Number three is the Christ-like selflessness of spiritual believers. If you, as you read all those verses in the latter part of chapter 12, these are not carnal people. These are not lukewarm people. These are people that are fervent in spirit and they're serving the Lord and they're considerate of other people. They are always thinking, what can I do? What can I do? These are not people you have to go and and jostle and uh, jolt and, and push and drive and draw before they serve the Lord wholeheartedly. They're not thinking about themselves anymore. My time, they stop talking about my time. My strength, they stop talking about my time. They, they stop talking about my, my, my. They're thinking of other, what can I do to lift somebody up? What can I do to help somebody there? What can I do to make one life there happy? What can I do to encourage somebody to get closer and draw nearer unto the Lord? These are people who are spiritual, not carnal. They are fervent, they are not lukewarm, and they are not cold either. They are hot for the Lord, and that is who you are this year. I said that is who you are this year. Awake, awake, and put on thy strength. This year, let the weak say, I am strong. You are strong in Jesus' name. Don't accept weakness. Don't say, I am tired. No, you are not. I said, no, you are not. 
That's, it. That's fake tiredness. The devil is trying to tell you that you are tired, but Jesus is saying, I am the strength of your life. I'm the power of your life. I am sick. No, you are not. I said you are not. Let the sick say, you're healed. Because by his strife, you are healed. That's why I cannot do that now because I am poor. I don't see any poor person there. Poor person, raise up your hand. You are poor, raise up your hand. No, you are not poor. Let the poor say, I am rich. You have everything this year. Blessings will flow into your life. While you are saying, I want to help this person. And your mind is there. I want to lift up this person. I want to give him something, but I don't have. No, don't say that. Just say, I want to help this person. I want to give this person, before this week runs out, what you will give him. Much more than you will give him. Well, come in your hand. Because this year, you will be a giver. And you will be a receiver. This year will be totally different in your life. By the time, we, if Jesus starts, by the time we come to the end of this year, you say, praise the Lord, I never knew that life was so exciting and so beautiful. You know, some uh, brother was asking the question, he says, uh, the GS never prophesies. That is prophecy. I said, that is prophecy. I've been telling you, when I told you there's no loss, there's no lack, there's no limitation, what is that one? When I tell you that this year will be the best year you ever lived in your life, what is that one? When I told you that every prayer you pray, God will answer, what is that one? When I told you you will not be a borrower, you will be a giver, what is that one? When I told you that every good thing that you sow this year, you will reap. You will reap. And then it will be overflowing. What is that one? When I said he anoints your, he anoints your head and your cup runneth over, what is that one? I prophesy it to your life. If you believe it, it will be well with you in Jesus' name. Three points we're going to look at. Three points we're going to look at. Number one, the compatible sacrifice of separated believers. Number two is the consecrated service of sanctified believers. Number three, the Christ-like selflessness of spiritual believers. Let's look at number one. I'm reading from Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 1. Here in Romans chapter 12, I beseech you therefore, therefore, because you are going to be a conqueror. Therefore, that word therefore means because, because of what had been said earlier. Therefore now I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's saying that you present your body unto the Lord. What does that mean? It simply means you present your mouth. No curse will come out of your mouth. Only blessing. Present your mouth to the Lord. Let him wash the mouth and then open that mouth and speak. You will share blessings with people. And the things that come out of you, everything will come back. Present your hands to the Lord. Help somebody. Present, uh, presenting your body to the Lord does not mean to go and hide somewhere and say, I will not see anybody, I will not touch anybody, I will not encourage. No, it means present this mouth to the Lord and say only what God wants to say to that person. Present these hands to the Lord and do only what God wants done to that person. Present this speech to the Lord and let it go where God God wants to bless somebody. Present these ears to the Lord so that it will hear only the word that will encourage you and inspire you. Present your eyes to the Lord so that you will see only what will benefit your life and benefit other people. This year, your ear, your mouth, your nose, and every part of you will have the touch of the Lord. And you present that as a sacrifice unto the Lord. That's what is acceptable. It is not just that you stay somewhere and I say, brother, what are you doing? I'm not doing anything. Why? 
I'm presenting my body unto the Lord. What kind of sacrifice is that? You'll be a living sacrifice. I said you'll be a living sacrifice. And then it says in verse 2, And be not conformed to this world. Why? Because the people of the world, they present their bodies to Satan in occultism. They present their bodies to idol worship. They mark their bodies with tattoos. They present their bodies to sin and to evil. It says, you are presenting the body to the Lord. You will not present your body to sin or to Satan or to any gang. You will not make any covenant and say, yes, I bring myself, mark my body. They will not mark your body. You will not receive the mark of Cain. The mark of the righteous will be upon your life in Jesus' name. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This year, the perfect will of God will be done in your life. The will of Satan will not be done in your life. The will of evil people will not be done in your life. As you present yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, here am I. I presented myself to you. Every part of me, my mind, my spirit, my soul, my body, everything belongs to the Lord. He will take care of what you present unto him. Look at Isaiah chapter 53, 43. Isaiah chapter 43. I'm reading from verse 7. Isaiah chapter 43. And we're reading from verse 7. It's, it tells us in verse 7, it says, Every for and even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him who created you. I have created him for my glory. That's why you present yourself to the Lord. You give yourself, you hand over yourself unto the Lord. I have we have created him for my glory. I have formed him. Yea, I have made him. Look at verse 21. In verse 21, it says, These people, who are the people? We are the people. If you are a child of God, you are the people. If you are born again, you are the people. If the blood of Jesus Christ has washed you, has cleansed you, these people have I formed for for the world, for Satan, for occultism, for secret cult. No, if you present yourself to secret cult, that's not the purpose of God. You're missing, you're missing the mark. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He created you for himself, and the best thing that can happen to you is to go back to God and say, God, I surrender my heart, my soul, my mind, my body, everything that I am, I give unto you and see how God will take care of you. He will take care of you. Look at it, verse 21. These people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. It tells us in, um, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Remember, it says, because of the mercies of God, because of the mercy that saved you, because of the mercy that converted you, because of the mercy that he revealed at the cross of Calvary, and it changed your life, it says, because of that, that's why you're presenting your body a living sacrifice unto God. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 14. It says in verse 14, for the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we see the love of Christ, we're so grateful. See what he has done. He paid the whole price. Now I am saved. Now I'm a child of God. And because of that mercy undeserved, because of that goodness undeserved that has poured upon my life in gratitude, I give myself back to him. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not live, shall not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. It says, because of what he has done, selfishness is cancelled for my lives, living for myself. Myself, myself, myself alone. I cannot share my property with others. 
I cannot share my belongings to, with others. I cannot share my gifts and my talents and my ability with others. I'm just enjoying all that God has given selfishly for myself. Says no, we cannot do that anymore because we're children of God and it's the love of Christ that compels us, that constrains us that controls us and says, this is the way to live. We'll live this better life in Jesus' name. We'll live this higher life in Jesus' name. First Peter chapter 2. In First Peter chapter 2. I'm reading here from verse 9. It says, but she are a chosen generation. Any chosen person there? The Lord has chosen you. And a royal priesthood. You have royalty in your blood. And it says, and holy nation, a peculiar people. Are you still there? A peculiar people. You'll be peculiar to the Lord. You will not be like the run and meal, like the ordinary, you know, people like Dick and Harry. You'll be a special person in the sight of the Lord. And you look at yourself that way, created by God, converted by Christ. And then you have all the, the Spirit of God saturating your life. You are not ordinary. And it says, because of that now, that you show forth the presence of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. You show His presence in Jesus' name. Uh, you will not be like the world. You'll be a different person. A higher species of person. A new creature in the Lord. And you present your body to the Lord as a purchased uh, object that the Lord himself has purchased. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, and ye which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? You see what is happening here? If you are born again, he has purchased you. He has bought you, spirit, soul, and body. All that you are, all that you will ever be, he has purchased you. Now, if you take that purchased possession, and you use it selfishly for you. It doesn't belong to you anymore. It says that will be wrong. And yet you say, I don't steal. Don't you steal? When you take the property that belongs to Christ, that he has purchased, and you are not using it for him at all, and you're only using it selfishly for yourself, that's not right. It says, what? No, ye not. You don't have the liberty to say, I will be a worker. I will not be a worker. The liberty is not there. I will give my time to Christ. I will not give my time to Christ. You don't have that liberty. I will serve the Lord. I will not serve the Lord. You don't have that liberty. I am considering it. Whether I will join the workforce or not, the liberty is not there. Look at that verse. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. What belongs to God? You belong to God. I said you belong to God. You will not go back to the world and you will not depreciate yourself, demean yourself, and give this precious property that the Lord has bought and give it to any useless thing, worthless thing, you are, you are greater than that. I said you are greater than that. And the honor, the glory God has put in your life, it will, you will not come down from that glory in Jesus' name. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1. Colossians 3, reading from verse 1. It says, If ye then be risen with Christ, Seek those things which are above. That's where your mind will be. That's where your heart will be. You have graduated from all those rudiments of the world. All the things that interest the people of the world. You have graduated. And uh, congratulations. I say congratulations. You're not, you're not down there below with all the other people. You're different from the people of the world. And that exalted position the Lord has given you. You will enjoy it in Jesus' name. If you then be rich, risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, 
which where Christ dwelleth on the right hand of God. Search your affection on, on what? On things above, not nightclubs, not the festivals of the world, not the merriments of the world, not the things that perish in the using, not the things that just, you know, make people intoxicated, makes them temporarily mad, insane. No, it says you will set your affections on things above. Not on things of the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. You will not appear with him in shame. You will appear with him in glory. Christ is coming, and when he comes, he's coming for you. And when the saints go marching in, I will be there. I said, I will be there. You'll be there in Jesus' name. You know, we're not of this world. We're different. He has made us different. And because he has made us different, we we'll want to demonstrate that life, show that life, that we are different and we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. We'll not be conformed to this world anymore. In First John chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 15. First John chapter 2, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Thank God he has saved us. He has redeemed us. And he has taken us out of all those dirty things. The interest is not even in our hearts anymore. I said interest is not in our hearts anymore. You know, they still want to, you know, do all those uh, things in the world. But uh, thank God, we are different. Am I talking about you there? I said, am I talking about you there? Where are you there? You are different. You are not of the world. The things of this world will not hold you down. Will not peg you down. When Christ shall come and the rapture will take place, the things, all those glittering things of the world, the people are gluing their minds on. You're already free from them, from them. And when it shall come, and then the dead in Christ shall rise. And then we which are alive shall be caught up together with them. As I look like this, I say, praise the Lord you made it. I said, praise the Lord you made it. Because the things of the world did not tie you down. You will go with the Lord in Jesus' name. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God, what happens? Abideth forever. Will abide forever in Jesus' name. Second Corinthians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Now we're transformed. We're transfigured by the renewing of the mind. A change is taking place on the inside because we're looking at Jesus. We're gazing on Jesus. We're trusting in Jesus. And we're getting the virtue of Jesus into our lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. It says, but we all, with open face, Beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You'll be changed from glory to glory in Jesus' name. Point number two the consecrated service of sanctified believers. Remember, we're looking at the road, road map to constant victory. How do we have constant victory? How do we experience that that is said in the doctrinal section of Romans? That, nay, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Here is the way. Here is the road map. Here is the blueprint. How we become and we remain more than conquerors. And that is who you are. We're coming to Romans chapter 12. And I'm reading here from verse 4. Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 4. It says, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. 
What's he saying? We have hands in the body, eyes in the body, ears in the body, nose in the body, intestines in the body, legs in the body. They don't have the same function. They don't have the same office. And there are people out of the spirit of competition. They leave their own function. They leave their own calling. They leave their own office. And they say, I want to be like so and so. I want to do what so and so is doing. The body of Christ will suffer when you try, when the leg tries to do the work of the hands, and the hands try to do the work of the eyes, and the eyes try to imitate the ears, and the ears try to imitate the nostrils wanting to breathe. But you stay in your office, you stay in your area, and what the Lord has made you to be, that's what you stay on. That's why it says over here, the body has many members, and it is as each of the members function, as they ought to function. That is how you will have a whole body contributing to the growth and the progress of the body. Because, um, look up here, if the left hand, for example, says, I'm not appreciated, I'm not um, encouraged, they don't recognize what I do. You, you know, you have left hands. There are people that use their left hands differently from the way you use your left hand. But everybody you see is the left hand. The left hand may not do what the right hand is doing, even though they are both hands. But it is useful. It is necessary. If somebody says, well, my ears are not even important. Or maybe it is my eyes that are not important. When something happens to that eye, then you will know that's very important. Every little member, even the ones that are covered, protected, they are all important. And you are important in the house of God. I said you are important in the house of God. You may not be the one that comes up there every time. And, uh, and sometimes those of us who have a visible ministry and demonstration in the house of God, it doesn't mean that you know we're more important than you are. It's just that this is our role and that is your role. And then everyone keeps to his role. This church will move forward. And every believer here will move forward. And your family will move forward. As you contribute to the growth of the body of Christ, the Lord will contribute to the growth of your life. And as you fulfill the desire of Christ concerning the church, all your good, good desires, they will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. And while you are still praying, you don't even have to pray long because you are totally giving to the Lord. Everything you desire, everything will be given in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 12, I'm reading here from verse 5. So, we be many a one body in Christ. There is unity, not uniformity. Uniformity means everybody dresses the same way, everybody looks the same way, everybody talks the same way. No, that's uniformity. But we have unity. You look at the hands are different from the legs, and the legs are different from the ears, and the ears different from the eyes. It is not uniformity, but they're all united together. If you drive a car, while you are driving the car, your leg is doing its part, your hands are doing their part, your ear is listening for any other extraneous sound, and your eyes are watching, all those members are not uniform, but they are united. This church will be united. The members will be united. And the workers will be united. It is in that unity, not uniformity, it is that unity in diversity that we're going to make the progress he has called us to. And it says, everyone, members of another, having the gifts different, but six, according to the grace that is given to us. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the profession of faith or ministry, let us wait on a ministry, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, or he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that, um, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. 
everything there is clear. Everything is like it says, there's prophecy there, it says there's teaching there, it says there's ministry, it says there's exhortation, it says there is giving, it also says there's ruling, administration. Everything is clear except, uh, you, you know, some people may wonder about the prophecy. First Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 3. It says in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 3, But he that prophesied speaketh unto men. What kind of thing does he say? It's going to rain tomorrow. No, that one does not edify anyone. What does, what does he do? It's going to, you know, this is going to happen. That's going to, no. Look at that. He that prophesied speaketh unto men to, what's the first word? Edification. What's the second word? Exhortation. What's the next word? Comfort. You're encouraging other people. You're taking the word of God. And what encourages anybody more than the word of God? What encourages anybody more than the word we're forth telling? And we tell you before it happens, we say as we end the service today, and you pray, and you pray with all your heart, God will answer your prayer. We are speaking to comfort you, to edify you, to encourage you, and to make you fervent in prayer. And then we're saying, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. That's prophecy already, that you'll find it to be true. God will fulfill that word. Any word that is spoken to you from the word of God, from the revelation of God, and it says, it edifies you, and it exhorts you, it encourages you, it comforts you, that's a prophecy the Lord is directing us to, and that prophecy will be fulfilled in your life in Jesus' name. Now, the people who do this, who render their service to the Lord and to the body of Christ, what state of mind should they be in? That's very important because we're talking about the consecrated service of sanctified believers. And let's go, this word sanctified, and let's explain it a little. Second Chronicles chapter 29. Second Chronicles chapter 29. And let us see what we can understand from what the Lord is saying. Second Chronicles chapter 29, and I'm reading from verse 5. In verse 5, it says in verse 5, And said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves. Number one. Sanctify now yourselves. Number two now. And sanctify the house of the Lord your God. What does that mean? Sanctify the house of the Lord your God. See what it means? The latter part of verse 5. And carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. Carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. Look up here for a moment. You see the temple. The tabernacle of the children of Israel are three parts. The outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. The holy of holies, that's where you have the Shekinah glory of God. And the holy place, that's where you have the showbread. The outer court, that's where they killed those animals and sacrifices that they offered to the Lord. But it was the children of Israel, there were some unclean things, some filthiness in the second compartment. That is in the holy place. And now they were to serve the Lord. And then the king told them, sanctify yourselves, that's yourself. But now, as we think of the tabernacle, at the holy place inside there that other people do not see. Because you see, when everybody comes, they can see the outer court, everywhere is clean. But there was filthiness in the holy place. Sanctify that house of God and take the uncleanness, filthiness out of the holy place. You see, we're like that tabernacle. Body, that's our outer court. The soul, that's the holy place. And the spirit, that's the holy of holies. And then it says, although we are saved, and on the outside, nobody can see any uncleanness. We don't tell lies. We don't steal. We don't do any of those external things anymore. We're saved. But in our heart, in our soul, in our mind, there are some things there that we don't want to see the light of day. People have, when they have animosity or hatred or madness and all that, we can smile on the outside. But all those things are filthiness in the sight of the Lord. Empty it. Let everything come out. 
cleanse the inward, the inside part, it is that inward holiness that the Lord is referring to when he says, sanctify yourselves. Look at verse 15. In verse 15 of that same chapter, and they gathered their brethren and they sanctified themselves. You see that? And they came according to the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of God. What were they doing when they were cleansing the house of God? They were sanctifying the house of God. Sanctification is cleansing. You feel clean on the inside. You lay everything on the altar. You consecrate everything before the Lord. And as you sanctify yourself like that, then you are able to render your service to the Lord without any defilement. You are able to render acceptable service unto the Lord. Verse 16. And the priest went into the inner part of the house of the Lord. You see that? Uh, the sanctification into the inner part of your life inner part of your being and they went to the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it and brought out all the uncleanness which they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord and the Levites took it to carry it out abroad into Bukidron that everything will flow away and all the things that have been in our lives and will come to Christ and now he sanctifies us everything will flow away in Jesus name they will not be there anymore in Jesus name because it is that's the condition of the people that is serving the Lord. Look at um, Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52. I'm reading from verse 11. Isaiah chapter 52. Before I read verse 11, let me read from verse 1. Awake, awake. Put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth, there shall not, there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. You see that? You see that condition? That's the condition he wants us to be. You are converted. And then he says, put on your strength. Christ is your strength. The unclean will not come into you anymore. I thought you would say amen there. In verse 2, shake thyself from the dust and sit down, O Jerusalem. Lose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Everything that held you captive this year, they are broken in Jesus' name. Look at, look at verse 7, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, and publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. It's talking about those who serve the Lord, and those who go to evangelize, those who go to tell other people, behold your God. Behold your Savior, and behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. It says, Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice. These are the people that are serving the Lord. Will lift up the voice, and then it says, With the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye. That's our unity again. We're united in this church. Thank God we're united. I said, thank God we are united. It says, they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. But how will that happen? The people that serve the Lord that way, what condition will they be? Look at verse 11 now. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence. Touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. It needs for us to be saved, to be cleansed, to be sanctified, to be made holy as we are bearing the vessel of the Lord. And you say that's Old Testament, of course. Look at the New Testament. Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 21. Second Timothy chapter 2. We're reading from verse 21. As we serve the Lord, He wants us to serve Him with sanctification. A sanctified heart. A purified heart. A cleansed heart. A holy heart. In Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these. It shall be a vessel unto honor. Tell me the next word there. Tell me out loud. 
tell me again. I'm going to read again. I'm going to give, get ready, get ready. I'm going to make you pronounce that word properly. If a man therefore purge himself from these, it shall be a vessel unto honor. Here comes your chance. Sanctified and meet or suitable, prepared for every for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. That, that's why sanctification is so important, very necessary. After you are saved, go back to the cross, go back to Calvary. Lord, cleanse me. Lord, purge me. Lord, purify me. I want to serve you, and you will serve the Lord. I said you will serve the Lord. You know, it may be you have just one talent, or maybe two talents, or five talents. You know the people that had five talents, they serve the Lord. And when the Lord came back, he rewarded them. He will reward your service. And those that had two talents, they served. They didn't say, well, I will use only one out of the two. If you have five talents, use all the five. If you have two talents, choose all the two. And the one that had only one talent, he was the one that went to bury the one talent. And when the Lord came back, he said, you slothful and wicked servant, you knew that I was going to reap where I didn't sow, but I gave you this. Why didn't you trade with it? And I said, take that talent from him and give to the one that has five, who has now come to have ten, and did this man throw him into the outer darkness. I pray that will not be your Lord. He wants you to show gratitude unto him that you are born again, that you are saved. And now you've come back to Calvary and he has sanctified you and you're serving the Lord. While you're serving the Lord, heaven will be serving you. The angels will be serving you. You'll be surprised the multiplied blessings that will be upon your life. It's a terrible thing. It's a terrible loss. A terrible lag. When you are not serving the Lord, the more you serve the Lord, the more your strength will increase. And the more the power of God will be in your life in Jesus' name. Your life will be brighter. Your family will be wonderful. And this year, as you serve the Lord, if it didn't get to you, you present yourself. We may not know you, that you have this talent, but you know you have the talent. That you have this gift, but you know you have the gift. You see, it is not a humility when somebody says, well, I don't have too much. I cannot do too much. You see, that's what Paul, the apostle, by the Spirit of God, was trying to correct among the people. There were those who were proud, and they were saying, I am the I, I have no need of you. I am the hand, I don't have need of the leg. And Paul the Apostle said, don't say that. You are not so important, you don't need other people. But there's the other side of the story. The people that said, well, I'm only a leg and there's not much I can do. They can do everything without me. He said, if everything were, if everybody were I, where were they hearing? And if everybody were hearing, where were they moving, the movement and the legs? That is, there's no superiority complex, there's no inferiority complex. God has given you grace, has given me grace, all of us are going to be useful together. And when we're sanctified, all that kind of, you know, keeping back yourself will not be there. You will come and you will exactly serve, in the, excitedly serve in the house of the Lord. And great will be the pouring of the blessings of God upon your life in Jesus' name. You know, if you are served and you're saying, I don't want to serve, would you really say you are sanctified? Would you really say that you are single-minded? Would you say you are steadfast? Would you say that you are totally selfless? If you are not giving yourself everything you've got to serve Christ and to serve the body of Christ, no, you cannot say that. But as you are sanctified and purified, you say, yes, Lord, here am I. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. This is your day. I said, this is your day. You'll not be hiding in that corner anymore in Jesus' name. In Hebrews chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 11. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. For both he that sanctified, that's Christ, and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause is not ashamed to call them 
brethren, the people are sanctified. Christ owns them and Christ publicizes them and Christ talks about them publicly. It's not a shame to call them brethren. I'm looking at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 12. Wherefore, Jesus also, that ye might sanctify the people with what what? With his own blood suffered without the gate. He suffered for your sanctification. He shed his blood for your sanctification. If you don't make use of that efficacious blood of the Lamb, and say, I'm saved, I'm saved, and you don't go forward to get sanctified, that's a part of what Jesus paid for that you are missing. You'll not miss it again. Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. He suffered, he shed his blood to sanctify us, will pray, will consecrate, will lay everything on the altar, will be sanctified. I said, will be sanctified. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. No hatred in our families this year. No separation in our families this year. Give me a good day. Amen. I can't understand. Some people, they say they are, you know, they believe the Bible, they are children of God, and uh, they can't they leave, uh, you know, apart. Husband here, wife over there. And before you got married, uh, you are, you know, thinking, when you are in honeymoon together, we will be together. We will stay together. We will do this together. Now, after some, you know, after some time, you love work more than your wife. You love whatever more than your husband. And then my husband, you understand that, you know, meet you, I have qualification, I have certificate, and they giving me a job in uh, China, and therefore, bye-bye, my husband. How about our marriage? Marriage, I want to go and get money. Money becomes more important than marriage. And then you're living far away. And then your husband is living, you know, cooking for himself and doing everything for himself. And he say. You left your family behind. It said, uh, well, I must eat. It's because of finance. There's no money in Nigeria. Therefore, my husband is there and I am here. We talk together on the phone. Ah. That's your marriage. It's a telephone line that controls your marriage. And when they cut it off, they cut you, you off. You have the message from our pastor, Pastor W.F. Kumoye the General Superintendent of the Palais Bible Church. It is my wish that as you listen, you will accept the old world and you will let them sink into the, your heart. And by the grace of the Lord, you will never regret it. It is my prayer that by next week, when our, our pastor shall come up again to present another message, you will be there, your family will be there, and your friends. And I believe as you are listening to the message every week, by the grace of the Lord, we will never be the same. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, O oh Lord, because of today's message. We thank you, O oh Lord, because of the one you let us listen to last week and the one we are going to listen to the next week by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. If we tarry, we shall listen together once again next week. And if not, every one of us will be there with you in the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because you are the Lord that answers prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.